I'm actually really gassed, it looks nice. You can't see it right now, but I'm, I'm smiling. I don't know why I'm showing my hand, but you can't, imagine there's a smiley, ha smiley face on my hand. There you go, okay. Two more parts to go. Ones that you can't see anything. The real ones know. Yeah, no. um. Hello, my name is Benga, and on the channel we talk about my plants and whatever else is on my mind. And today we are mostly in the latter section where we're talking about what's on my mind. And this is something that's been something that I've thought about for a while, and that is the topic of asking questions. I believe that asking questions is an art form and I hope that I can convince you of this throughout the length of this video. I don't know how long it will be, but there's a lot to talk about, so let's just get to it. I want to start off by asking you the question and I'd like you to think about the answer, think about the answer for you and write it down. You can write it in the comments, you can write it on a piece of paper or wherever. But I do actually want you to think about this question and think of your own answer because it will be relevant later on. So my question for you is, are you a creative person? Think about it. I'll give you like 30 seconds to think. Okay, time's up for now, but if you want to keep writing, keep ask, uh, answering the question, then feel free to pause, write some more things down. But um, I really would like you to think about your answer to the question. So I want to lay out my main, I guess, thesis on questions. And I would say that questions are a pretty integral part of the human experience. It's really about the way that we interact with the world and it's Primarily, the way that we learn is by using questions. And we do this in an educational environment where we ask questions to probe, to ask, to ask and to learn more about a specific topic. We also use it as a way to interact with our environment and to learn about what's going on around us. But perhaps most importantly, we use this as a way to understand people. And we ask other people questions, which teaches us more about them and their own context, background, and so on. So questions are a very integral part of the human experience. I would maybe go so far as to say it's maybe the cornerstone of all human relationships is questions. And so I think it's really worth understanding the role that they play, maybe how to ask good questions, and my favorite thing, which is how to question the question. I really think that looking at questions can unveil a lot about people, their context, how they think, what they see in the world, and you can learn a lot about really about society from looking at the questions that we ask. So circling back to the question I asked at the beginning, which is, are you a creative person? I want you to stop and to look at the answer, look at the answer you wrote down and think about what that answer says about you. Why did you answer the question like that? I'm going to give you a couple seconds to think. So I would assume that a lot of people would have answered that question on the basis of what they do as their main job, their main way of making money. And if that's deemed to be in a creative field, then they're more likely to have answered yes to the question. But if what they're doing is not unanimously seen as a creative field, it's much less likely that they would have answered that question as a yes. And to me, that kind of indicates that people see their job as an important and big part of their identity 
and they also see that as a validation as the kind of person that they are because if they are perhaps they are someone who thinks in what in ways that people might think are creative but their actual job title and job function on a day-to-day -day basis if they're doing a nine-to-five job to make the majority of their income if that's something that is not really seen as creative by the majority of people then they're much less likely to answer that question as a yes and that's something that I think is interesting because it's really just about how other people perceive you, not necessarily about how you perceive yourself. Of course, what is seen as creative and not creative is kind of subjective. But the core here, as I'm trying to get at, is the way you answer that question indicates to the person asking it, or to me who's 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 listening, if it's if you're imagining me asking you the question, it indicates not only how you see yourself but also how you interpret the question can also lead me to understand how you see, how you sit, sit within the world. If you view it as a very rigid spectrum of creative all the way along to not creative at all, a lot of people, I guess, would put themselves somewhere in the middle. But I would kind of say that a lot of people will downplay how creative they are, especially if, like I said, they're not working in a field that is seen as objectively creative. So for example, you could be an accountant and in your role, you're not doing something that is seen as that creative, but maybe you have a very significant hobby that is creative, but you may have asked that question as a no. But even within the role of accountancy or as a lawyer or a doctor, there are ways in which you can be creative and think of creative solutions to problems, but do things that are, once they're explained, pretty objectively agree to be creative, but because the job function itself doesn't come across as that, people may deny themselves that label. I want to ask you a different question, and I want to see what your answer will be to this one as well. So I'll give you another 30 seconds to answer this question as well. This question is, in what ways are you creative? Okay. Now, again, I want you to look at the answer that you've written down, consider it, think about how you answer the question and why you answer the question that way. Now, of course, you will be able to tell that I'm not trying to do a strict A-B test. Those questions aren't like for like. They are different, but they're different on purpose. You'll notice that within the second question, there's an implicit assumption that you are creative but I'm actually more interested in which specific ways are you creative? How does creativity manifest in your life? How does it show itself in a way that can be perceived by other people and by the self? The reason that I, sometimes I ask this question to people is because like I mentioned before, I think a lot of people do tend to downplay how creative they are, particularly if they don't work in a field that is seen to be creative, objectively speaking. So I asked the question because I think it makes people think and they um, they look at their own life in a bit of bit more of a critical lens rather than immediately denying themselves the label of I'm not a creative person. They look at the things that they do and try to find the creativity that was always there. But I'm asking the question in a way to prompt them to think like that, which is why I find embedding the assumption that you are creative in that question yields very different results. But that leads me to my next point, which is about assumptions. A lot of questions, maybe even all questions actually, have assumptions built into them. And we'll come on to uh, down the line about questioning the question, but assumptions can, like I said, affect the way you answer. So a small example might be, imagine you're at a party, um, everyone's talking and drinking, everyone has a, a cup in their hand, and someone might ask or go up to a person and it's kind of standard practice maybe to ask maybe what are you drinking or blah 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 but someone who notices that someone else is drinking water or something non-alcoholic a question a common question might be how come you're not drinking 
the assumption of that question is pretty clear, which is that there must be a reason why you're not drinking alcohol, participating in the group activity that most people are doing. And that assumption is telling in itself because one, why do you expect this person to, by default, be engaging in the same group activity as everybody else? Why must why are you assuming that that person may not be different? But also, you're assuming that there must be a specific reason that that person can articulate to you why they're choosing to deviate from the norm. Um, in my experience, I would say that the assumption here is typically based in religion or health. Most people tend to assume that that's the reason why you're not drinking for one of those two reasons. Um, but of course, those can range. But my point is, the way that question is phrased has an assumption in it, and that tells you a lot about the person asking the question. So the question, the way it's phrased, and the way the assumption is baked in can also let you know something about the questioner, just like your response can tell you something about the questionee. Uh, another scenario for you might be someone who's maybe looking a bit down, maybe doesn't seem to be their usual self, they're being a bit quiet, and someone asks them, what's wrong? Baked into the assumption, uh, baked in assumption to that question is that there is something wrong. This one is taken directly out of my own life experience. For those of us who have a face that when it's in its resting position, it does not come across as necessarily the most pleasant, content, etc. I get this question very frequently and I find it annoying because I get asked so much, but I find it kind of intriguing because again there's an assumption that okay this person's face doesn't look as welcoming or natural as the average person or the one i'm used to so that person is deviating so i can question them on why is it that you're different why are you deviating from the norm of course that might normally be set by yourself so they may say you look less happy than usual so there must be a reason for that but the point i'm trying to drive at is that there's an assumption that there is something wrong and that that person can articulate it and say that back to you when you ask that question, what's wrong? And to make it clear, I'm not trying to say that there's anything wrong in asking these questions, but I'm just trying to get you to think about what assumptions may be baked into the way you ask a particular question. I think at this point we can understand that questions are powerful, they're drivers of conversation, they can also reorient and redirect the way the path that the conversation is going down. And I also think it's important to, to acknowledge that this can be used for less than positive means. You can deflect and you can redirect the question for your own personal gain. That may not be, I guess, the morally correct thing to do. An example might be, let's say you have two people, person A and person B in a romantic relationship. And person A sees something on person B's phone that they think is suspicious, that might be indicative of unfaithfulness or, or something else. And so person A confronts person B about this and says, what's this in your phone? Uh, what's this about? Et cetera, et cetera. Person B might retort by saying, well, why were you even looking at my phone anyway? Why are you looking at my phone? That's a violation of privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And you see how person B has now reframed it as person A's wrongdoing, even though I guess the core issue here should be that person B has something on their phone that maybe looks suspicious or maybe they're doing something wrong. So questions can be used to reframe things. And on a more macro level, this thinking can be applied to so many things, including things like politics. Think about how many times you've watched the news or, or kept up with what's going on, and politicians and particular political parties for their own ends seem to pose these maybe false dichotomies whereby people are encouraged to pick a side. You know, you're for this, that means you're against that. And if you're not against that, that means you're for this and so on. And if you want, you know, this thing to happen, like this particular policy to be enacted, then that means you're unable to enact this one. And sometimes that is not even the right question to be asking. It's like, you know, should we pay for free healthcare in the country or should we pay for 
free education up, the, up to the age of 18. And of course, assuming budget constraints and whatnot are remaining equal, in a lot of places, the government doesn't create that dichotomy because they just ask the question, well, both are important. So rather than say, do we want this one or that one? How can we make sure that we can provide both? So ultimately, that might be the correct, in inverted commas, question to ask, as opposed to sticking with the assumption that there must be a choice between one and two. Leading off from assumptions that are baked into questions, I'd also just like to, to call out the fact that we we live in a society and as a function of that, we tend to have certain habits that we quite, quite naturally replicate that we may not ourselves even realise that we're doing. So like I mentioned in the previous examples, those are questions that a lot of people would have asked in a very innocuous way. And that's probably in part because they've heard other people ask that question before. And the reaction is usually not particularly, um, I guess, notable or negative, really. And so people tend to repeat the same questions because the, the answer or the response wasn't bad. But I would say that repeating or asking questions in this way, whilst it has maybe some potential downsides, I think it's indicative of a way that we actually, as humans, interact and find ourselves maybe feel closer to each other. Because we ask questions in a way and a certain format with certain respect expected responses. If you ask someone what's wrong, typically speaking, the person is going to either say nothing, I'm fine, or they're going to tell you maybe what's wrong, but usually in a fairly surface way. They're not going to jump straight into all of the trauma they've gone through in their life, because in a, at least societies that I'm most familiar with, it's typically seen as expected for you to withhold and to not just, I guess, open up just because someone asks you what's wrong on a surface level. But these kind of social rules that are maybe potentially can be a bit complicated and you have to have experience in that society to understand the nuances of what's going on. They are, like I said, unspoken rules that kind of create this web, this feeling that we actually understand each other, we know each other because we're almost communicating on a, on a uh, not subconscious, a on, a, in an, on an imperceptible level. Is that the word I'm looking for? Uh, some sort of level or plane which is it's really subtext I'm saying this thing but I really mean this and when I ask you this I expect you to respond like this we're doing this kind of social dance that continues to affirm to each other that we understand each other we understand how the dynamic works maybe we grew up in the same area or the same we speak the same language or something else is being communicated that is not explicit in the words and that, again, makes us feel like we, we're on the same page, we're understanding each other, because we both know what this means, even though it's not explicit in the words that we're using. Now, while I'm not commenting on whether or not this practice is good or bad, as I know it's pretty normal for us to replicate and to mirror what other people do in the society that we live in, because it helps us to feel closer, we build bonds with people in that way. And even though it sounds weird, like using the wrong question actually does your benefit because you're using that question kind of incorrectly in the same way that everyone else is doing it. So you kind of fit in in that way. Though that's, that may be the case and there may be possible benefits as a result of that. I do think there are some downsides to allowing questions to sort of lose their meaning or to take on a new meaning because think about how many times someone has asked you, how are you? And you know that when someone asks you that question, you're not really going to be expected to answer that question honestly or you're definitely not expected to answer that question at length for the most part it's an opportunity to open a conversation and to maybe highlight some things that have happened to you recently uh, but it's not really an opportunity to have a, like a full-on deep dive session on the state of your mental health but that does mean it can be difficult to actually ask direct questions about a topic because you need to find another way around it, another route to getting to that question. So instead of sticking to the normal question format or standard questions that we ask each other all the time, 
I'd like to encourage you to question the question and push back on those canned, repeated, learned answers and questions that you're so used to going back and forth about, but actually think about what is it that I'm trying to ask this person and how can I ask them in the most honest way that communicates exactly what I'm wanting to know from them. But all is not lost. I think that just like the title of this video, there is an art to asking questions. And I think that's something that we can all work on and all think about to try and improve. Ultimately, I think questions are an opportunity, an opportunity to connect with a person, to share your thoughts and to, I guess, sometimes to connect with a part of yourself that you wouldn't have been able to reach by yourself. And as question askers, I think that you're in a position of, of great power in that you're able to ask a question that can unlock that for somebody else. And I think that is the essence of the power of good question asking. Whilst I was preparing for this video, I was talking to my friend about it and we had a brief conversation. So I want to share that with you now. She sent me a text that says, for your questions video essay, if you want to prompt someone to be authentic and playful and generative, you usually need to just ask them something where they have a rich experience to pull from, but have never pulled an answer from that experience before. If you ask two or three increasingly detailed questions about something they tell you, you get there. And I responded by saying, what's standing out for me here is the never pulled an answer from that experience before. I'm thinking about the times that sometimes you ask a question and the response is almost thankful that you allowed them to enter that part of themselves and come back with something. There's a special kind of pleasure that comes from hearing a good question. Not that there are objectively good or bad questions, but a question that is good for you at that moment. Honestly, I think that a good question doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be super eloquent or maybe maybe well thought out. Sometimes it's just about timing. Sometimes you are just having a normal conversation with a friend that you've known for ages and they just time that, how are you doing? Or how are you feeling about X? They just time that question so well that it just unlocks all of the emotions at once and you're able to kind of unblock and release all of your pent up emotions. But other times, yeah, it is about the question being worded in a certain way or being eloquent or combining lots of things together to present you a question where from that covered topics that you had never thought to bring together. But ultimately, I think it's something that everyone can improve on with some Slight, slight tweaks and somewhat paying attention to even how you receive questions when other people ask them to you. I also think you can learn a lot about yourself using questions. Of course, you can ask yourself questions, which is one method, thinking and sitting and thinking, okay, why am I upset? What is it that upset me, etc. But sometimes asking questions about you to someone else can also give you some really deep insight. You know, asking somebody, what do you think that I'm good at? Or what do you think is a quality of myself that I don't see that other people do? Or what do you think I'm insecure about? Those kinds of questions can give you insight into yourself in a way that maybe you couldn't do by yourself, but you can make use of people around you to kind of reflect back a part of yourself that you can't directly access. So as a result of the question in the question angle, I would say that oftentimes questions can do with some rewording or maybe just some straight up substitutions. There are some questions that, sorry, I believe that need to be abolished and we should stop asking them altogether and find other ways of asking the question because the one that we say all the time doesn't mean anything. I would argue that maybe how are you? We just get rid of it. Why are we asking that question? There are better ways and more interesting ways to ask these common questions that actually yield the results or ask the que the real question that you right, really, really wonder, not using this sort of veneer to ease into the conversation. Of course, 
personality thing, some people will find it a bit jarring and blunt to ask a very direct question, but uh, maybe that's just maybe that's just how I am. Um, so I'm going to just go through some potential substitutions that you may want to consider. But if you have any more suggestions, then please leave a comment down below. I'd be very curious to see what kind of substitutions that you have tried, that you like, or that you would consider. So a question that I get asked all the time is, what kind of music do you like? And I don't like this question for many reasons, but at its core, I don't like it because I think it feels to be quite a reductive question to asking me to essentially what you're uh, most people are really expecting is a couple of genres and maybe a few artists and that's really it but music doesn't really neatly just segment like that first of all i'm not going to get into it i promise i'm not going to get into it but genre how useful is that as a label the use of it is it only goes so far and i think genres as strict um categories are becoming less and less relevant because genres are starting to blend people borrow from all sorts of places etc um and of course listing artists fine that's not necessarily a bad thing but like i said typically it's quite reductive because one i'm going to think of the artists that are most recently ever played or looked at it's in their name somewhere very recently on my phone but i can't really give you an accurate read of the kind of music i like because I'm not a machine that can just surface that information that quickly. I will probably just give you some examples of things that I've been listening to recently. And then again, I guess if that's really the question, which is you want to know what was the last song I listened to or what's the music I've been listening to lately, then that could be a better question to ask. Typically, people, I, I like it when people ask me, okay, what's an album that you've enjoyed recently? Or what's a new release you're really excited about? I like when the question is more specific because I can actually answer it for one, but then that can be a natural segue to other things. But asking such a generic question for me just goes over my head and I just find it more difficult to answer. Um, another example of a reword or substitution might be, so the typical question might be, what's your favorite food? And again, don't love this question, but I might substitute it with something like, what is a food that for you conjures a very specific memory in your mind? That's a really nice way to get into someone's um, I guess they're into maybe their life story. It might tell you about their relationship with a specific person, a specific city, a specific restaurant. All kinds of things can come up when you ask the question in that way. And you still potentially will get to the answer of what's their favorite food, but you can take maybe a more scenic route and learn more things about them in the process. A question that we just must abolish, I don't even have a substitution, but we just need to get rid of it. What do you do in your spare time? Or maybe what hobbies do you have? Delete that question. It doesn't exist. I hereby decree it. I don't have a gavel, but imagine I had a gavel and I banged it. No more. A substitution that I came up with recently whilst I was in the shower, I think, which I really like, is the typical question might be, what are you passionate about? Or maybe what are your passions? But the reword, just a slight change, is what do you get passionate about? And I like this one because the first one, not only is it a typical question that people ask a lot, so therefore people's answers tend to be kind of pre-prepared and generic, um, but also I think it, again, not because of the words, but more because of the societal implications, asking someone what they're passionate about, I think, typically people tend to answer with something that, well, people tend to feel as though they need to answer in a way uh, where they talk about something that they spend a lot of time on. If you're passionate about something, it would, you know, consume your mind. You're thinking about it when you wake up in the morning. You spend your, dedicate your life to it. Or it's something you're doing on the side, trying to fit in around something else. But still, you're kind of uh, dedicating a lot of time and effort and energy to get that thing done. But whilst that may be true, passions don't necessarily have to manifest in that way for every single person and at every point in your life. I like the question, what do you get passionate about? Because... For me at least as a person when i thought about my answer to that question it again kind of takes a scenic scenic route but we do still talk about my passions so things that i get maybe very heated about or i can argue about for a long time or i get very excited about or that let me smile those are things that i get passionate about 
but they also kind of hint at my passions in life. And it, I think because of the way that that first question has over the years built up so much weight and meaning, taking the second option, I think allows you to answer the question in a way where you're not thinking about the additional implications of how much time do I spend on this and do all the other people recognize it as a passion, but you can still get to the, uh, the answer. Um, I feel like I should answer the question, so I guess I will. So <laughs> if someone asks me what I'm passionate about, um, what would I even say? See, I am honestly struggling even just now to think of an answer of what am I passionate about. I typically don't even answer the question and yeah, I struggle with it. But I think if someone asks me what do I get passionate about, that is easier because I can think of specific events and instances and feelings and emotions that I remember that then lead to an answer. So for example, what do I get passionate about? Um, I'd say, well, if you can tell, I get passionate about plants, um, hence the whole channel. Um, but the way that I know that is because I can sit on YouTube for hours watching videos back to back to back to back of people just talking about their plants and talking about how this one grew and this one isn't doing so well and I bought this plant yesterday and this one is green and this one is pink and I can just do that for hours and without flinching because I'm enjoying it and I guess that is something that I get like I guess periods where I can do that for days on end because and I can recognize that as a time where I am getting passionate about this particular topic. I'd say I also get passionate about um, music but particularly I can get very passionate about a new either artist genre or song that I recently discovered and I just loop it and I get so invested. I know I get passionate because I start to play that playlist, that artist, that album, that song over and over and over again and I can tell because it's in my head whenever I'm not listening to something it's just playing in the background and I need to get back to my Spotify so I can play the song again and that kind of I guess obsessive behavior is a manifestation of me getting passionate about that thing but if you just zoom out and say then therefore what is my passion I guess my passion is probably like music discovery and the feeling and the uh, process of diving into this new world that I've discovered that may, may last a day, may last two weeks, may last five months in the case of a piano. You know, music discovery is the passion, but asking me what do I get passionate about is a way for me to kind of get there, but also maybe tell you a story along the way. Maybe as I found this song on this night out, I shazammed it, and then I played it in the car, and I discovered that whole artist, I went through the whole catalogue, you know, there's more of a story to it, and I like a story. Um, I really think, I well, hopefully, I have convinced you with all these many examples and this um, meandering conversation that there is a lot that goes into questions and asking questions. I mean, that's why people literally get trained in asking questions for different purposes, like if you're an interrogator, if you're a detective, if you're a journalist, there are different question types and formats. And of course, when it's kind of a profession we see it as like a legit thing but I hope throughout this you've thought about questions and why they're important and the importance of actually asking questions and thinking about how you answer the question how you ask the questions before I round up I'm also just going to give a quick shout out to I'm not going to name him but I just, he just reminded me of how I used to have a lecturer who wouldn't refuse to end the lecture without taking questions and at first I found it quite annoying, but after a while I actually saw the benefit of it because he required questions, which meant that you had to pay attention, but also you, if in order to actually ask a relevant question, you need to actually understand, or at the very least, know what you don't know. And that is super powerful. When you know you don't know anything, that's one thing, but if you don't even know what you don't know, then you're kind of stuck. But if you know 70% and you know that there's a 30% that's got this title that you don't know anything about you can ask okay how do i know more about this that gives you direction and something to do and that is probably a better position to be in than not knowing where to even start um so shout out to that lecturer for making me see the importance of questions and taking the time to actually think of one it's not about thinking questions super quickly but just the fact that you have a question is already a sign that you're on the right track okay 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, I well, I guess I probably should leave you with a song before I go. Um, before I go, I'm gonna leave you with a question, and then I'll leave you with a song. So my question for you is: since we're on the topic of music, what is a song that takes you back to a very specific point in your life? That's my question. Um, and maybe my music, my 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 song should be my answer to that question. So what's the song that takes me back to a very specific point in my life? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, okay, there's loads of answers flashing through my mind right now. Okay, okay, I've got a great one. Um, I kind of cheated because I had so many, but I just didn't want to talk about those. But the one that I really do want to talk about is Mask Off by Future from, I don't even know what year that song came out in. But um, (laughs) I have a very specific memory relating to that song, which is I went to Thorpe Park with some of my friends in 2017, I want to say. And that was around the time that Mask Off was super big and there was a Mask Off chat. Did we start the Mask I can't remember if there was an actual Mask Off challenge online or if we just did this and we called it the Mask Off challenge. But we, <laughs> in the queue to one of the rides in Thor Park, we did an, a group a cappella performance of Mask Off, <laughs> um, which involved vocals in the back it involved like you know a lead rapper it involved some hype men some dancing i was the conductor of the group um (laughs) if you were involved then i know you know what i'm talking about so shout out to you for watching if you're watching let us know in the comments or just dm me or something if you want to you know bait yourself out but that that is a great memory that I will actually remember for probably the rest of my life and that's always going to be attached to that song um, but yeah look how much I'm smiling see that is a much better question than what kind of music do you like anyway let me get off my soapbox goodbye I do not know why I ended that so abruptly but fear not I'm here in post-production to give you the outro if you enjoyed this video please leave a like if you have something to say If you have a question or you have a comment about questions, then please leave a comment so I can read your thoughts and we can have a discussion. If you like this style of video, then I'm going to leave one right here on the screen that you can get into straight away next. If you're here for plants and plants only, then here's a video for you just over here. And if you want to see more of me in general, no matter what I'm doing, then make sure to subscribe right here and follow me on Instagram. My link is in the description. Thank you.